Last time I was talking about uh, Sejong the Great, and I didn't get to the 25. I stopped at 17. I might have skipped a number. I might have said a couple numbers twice. I can't quite tell. But I know, <clears throat> I know I never got to 18. Dedicated to Archimedes. Sejong the Great is the Isaiah of Asia. Isaiah 111, right? Is it 19 or 19? 19 or 19? 19. Sejong the Great is the Isaiah of Asia. 20. Sejong the Great is the Isaiah of Asia. I'm sorry for was how I was last time. I'm sorry for the way I am now. I just want to follow through on this one thing because even if it's funny, even if I'm mocked for saying it, I don't mind creating a chocolate rain moment if it's remembered for good reason. 21. Sejong the Great is the Isaiah of Asia. Harmonically from different directions, not quite the same in many ways. So much more exalted and in many ways so much more degraded because who's ever heard of Sejong the Great? Just another one of the greats, Alexander the Great, Osman the Great. No. Sejong the Great, man. You want to talk about and his daughters. And specifically one dot. It's the story of Iamblichus and his daughter. And both of their tutelage beneath Platonus. A master of intellect, a master of philosophy, a master of spirituality. and economics. You know, what Catholic Christianity did for women with Mary, people don't realize. All, I shouldn't say all, nearly all, well, here's the thing, in the West, all, essentially, progress of women is related back to the Christian Catholic conception of Mary, or the three Marys. And that harkens back to the Egyptian, Mary, M-E-R-I, beloved, in that long tradition that reaches back to Ethiopia and along that other sea toward India. Did I say 21 yet? If I, if I already did, I'll say it again. Sejong the Great is the Isaiah of Asia. What do I mean? I mean, as Dugan said, time time doesn't move the same way among cultures. Along this sphere of the earth, time bubbles, time boils, time broils.
the separations between waters and oils and peroxides. These boundaries are not easily enumerated yet. They're completely rational, completely physical, completely empirical. But the numbers of their order across investigative dimensions exceed most of our abilities and resources to c compute, contemplate, resolve. 22. Sejong the Great is the Isaiah of Asia. 23. Sejong the Great is the Isaiah of Asia. 24. Sejong the Great is the Isaiah of Asia. What do I mean? No. Can we canonize an Old Testament saint that exists after the New Testament? But we don't understand the boundaries of time. We don't understand that the Old Testament is still valid. We don't understand that we're all that we've been for 150 years, anyway, in the next, the third testament. For 150 years at least, 200 years. We've been in the third testament. Yet the Old Testament is still valid. The New Testament, quite frankly, just barely, reigns the world. The triumph of the Third Testament, which is, which was begun more than a hundred years before I was born, it's coming to the fore. Like, even if your life really, really sucks, like, if you get, if you get this point, like, congratulations. Like, The new book is being written, and don't turn around too quick, or you might see yourself writing the new book, you. That's a very hopeful message. Did I already say 24, or am I going to say it again? How many times will I say this? Plus, when I said it before I started counting. Was it once or twice? Do I have to say it 30 times to get to 25? Or will I say it 23 times and call it 25? 24. Sejong the Great is the Isaiah of Asia. When we unlock that key, when we take those thumbs off, Twenty-five. Sejong the Great is the Isaiah of Asia. In history, in documents, in pages, and what's so incredible is that these, I can't remember how many people between the North and South Korea, 70 million people who speak Hangul, Sejong the Great himself spent years and years and years to construct, I think it's like three pages, maybe five, maybe a page, it's like less than five pages, Sejong the Great created the Korean language. And then in another 20-something pages it was explained. And that's it. It's like a 30-something page book. And that's the basis of the language the most scientific, rational language 
ever created by a monarch. So for those who say absolute power corrupts absolutely, There wasn't an English king who lives up, who lived up to Homi, Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan. There are a lot of things you could say about Leviathan, and there are a lot of things you could say about Thomas Hobbes. But one of the most interesting things you could say about Thomas Hobbes, if you were to say anything at all, is that his mathematical works have not been as well preserved. He went to his deathbed, proclaiming he had squared the circle. And all we have is historical records of those who say, well, no, he didn't. You know, but where's the meat of the matter for those of us who are interested in such things? All that embroilment between, you know, infinitesimals and so on. Right? The birthing of calculus, well, philosophically, Hobbes with Wallace, is embroiled in that debate, you know, infinities and incommensurabilities, and the way those things meet up. But so far as in the Leviathan, when Hobbes uh, defends the idea of the sovereign king, which is the predecessor to defending the sovereignty of anyone, any single soul, human, any single woman, any single homin. One of the reads on Hobbes is that it's a political power play. A globally Western political power play. And <clears throat> any philosophical truth that could be ascribed to it is kind of negated nowadays, yet we can make a kind of sense of Unless we look at Sejong the Great. And historically, now myth a lot, see, that's the thing. Sejong the Great is both a historical and a mythological character. And what I'm saying is, he's, he's unique in the position that he's kind of, well, he's certainly the only one that is filtered down to me. You know, the only other person I can think of is Tubman. Yeah, not even Martin Luther King. And Tubman, because of her... Tubman was so repressed, and she did something so remarkable by the numbers. Same with Sejong. A king is in a kind of bureaucratic repression. And the way he assumed power with right philosophy. Sejong the Great collapsed upon the correct philosophy, extended it to everything he looked at, and coalesced everything, and coalesced the true power of the collective individuals to give him the power to push back upon the bloated bureaucracy of essentially the the bureaucratic, oligarchic, ruling, popular ruling class, who had a lot of power and influence on him by number. But he logically and spiritually, morally, ethically, and rationally, by the numbers, by creating census, a census, of opinion.
one of the first, if not the first, public opinion poll to give him the power. Here was a king who took an opinion poll from the people to gain the power they had by the numbers to empower him to have power over the bureaucracy that was overpowering his familial dynasty with their greed. He used ration and reason to empower the people, to empower him to fight on their behalf against the bloated, oligarchical, ruling class bureaucracy to give the common poor person more rights. One of the reasons 70 million people speaking Korean in the West and the East have their thumbs on both of the Koreas partially to suppress the power of their language and the power of the story of Sejong the Great. Don't think for a second the greedy powers of the West or the East wouldn't wish to snuff both of them out because they're so successful. Japan is successful because we, Americans, after World War II, sent our best people over there. Right? After World War II, we stopped using the best people here in America. We sent them to Japan and made Japan the fucking powerhouse. And to Germany, because we learned our lesson. After World War I, we, we put a fist on Germany. After World War II, we helped rebuild Germany. Well, now, Germany is the powerhouse of Europe. Now Japan is, now of course China is the powerhouse of Asia, except for the point that like there's over a billion people in Asia and like Japan's this little tiny island, yet it's the most industrious, robotic. And if we weren't putting our thumb on Japan, it already would have exploded. Korea is different in a way. Now we did help with South Korea and all that, but The true power of both of the Koreas is the Korean language, created by Sejong the Great. Philosophy. Thousands of... That's what people don't realize. The dude was sick and dying. He condensed thousands of years of Eastern philosophy, simplified it. It's It's considered by linguists the most scientific language in the world. It's tied with English for first place. Korean, Hangul, the Hangul language created by Sejong the Great. You know, five, six hundred years ago. When people were, were illiterate. Now, Korea is the most illiterate. Korea used to be, you know, tied for last place of most illiterate place on the planet. Six hundred years later, the most the most literate place on the planet because of a king who created a language not from the dust, not from the clay, but from the ashes of China, from the ashes of Mandarin. At about the same time, the printing press was coming about. At about the same time, English as a language, as the least scientific language, except mathematically, but as a language, the most symbolic, the most strained, the most phonetically strange, the most hodgepodge. Thank you, Shakespeare. But this king could have done so many things. But he grew up in an environment and he saw essentially all the scumbags who were sucking off the top. And he fixed it. And he's a saint. He 
battled in a certain way. There's this Buddhist versus Confucius thing going on. But a lot of that also had to do with the politics of, loosely speaking, the politics of religion. Without knowing the specifics of the day, it's hard to say exactly what that meant philosophically. But when we look at what he did for the people, there's just simply no doubt. He gave maternity leave. Sejong the Great gave paternity leave. Sejong the Great, like, enacted in law paternity leave for fathers in, like, the 14-1500s. It was short-lived, but that was his vision for the future. That was his vision for truth, care, love. He created a language that was phonetically based so that the people who are already speaking in a certain way could take what they're speaking and phonetically spell it out and like offer it. He created the Korean language so that one of the reasons he created the Korean language was so that poor people could make complaints like against their landlords or against their regional office holders or whatever. People had no way to speak out. Sejong the Great created the most literal, the, the most, he created a language that transformed the least literate, some of the least literate people in the world into the most literate two nations in the world. Love them or hate them. Imagine the power. Imagine the power and love of a unified Korea that's unified beneath Sejong the Great. Right? Oh, well, you're just looking up to a king and it's patriarchal. Yes, I get that. I'm not looking up to every patriarch. I'm not looking up to every king. But not for one second. It's that rare occasion because we love the underdog. And that's why I mentioned like Harriet Tubman. Some people, yeah, even some people don't like Harriet Tubman. Some people don't. Some people don't like Martin Luther King Jr., right? And, and I know I'm just skating across the surface of things. I, I don't know a lot. I'm, I'm not very in-depth. I come from my perspective. So forgive me if I'm not mentioning, like, your favorite, you know, saint or person. But, like, that's why I mentioned Harriet Tubman because she's, to my mind, the ultimate American underdog. And in the scowl of the lines of her forehead, she has a little circle fucking third eye just imprinted right in there, like in flesh, in sculptural flesh. Her concern makes a little dot right in the middle of her fucking head, man. You can't make that shit up. You can't make that shit up. But every so often, also, there does come a true king. So we're looking at all these proof in all these different directions just to say, can it, can it even happen? Right? We're trying to prove this text or that text or this religion or that religion. And we're trying to prove these things that are so far back in time that like it, it takes a lot of faith. It takes a lot of work. It takes what well, the thing that doesn't take a lot of work for is Sejong the Great. And what he did was so miraculous and so historical. It, it hits every point. It's like the perfect pinball machine. It's like you pull it back and every knob gets point and you win. Sejong the Great is a historical figure. What he did, like, I'm not trying to make it so that you worship him above all else. Because I know I'm going on, Sejong the Great, Sejong the Great, Sejong... I'm not trying to make it be like all this type shit. I'm just trying to put it out there as like, here's a historical figure who gave his life, died young, sick, but made a contribution that is so huge 
Right? Now, we look at Alexander the Great, but we know he was a fucking brutal killer. Right? Maybe there were some good, maybe, I mean, Library of Alexandria, blah, 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 so on. Right? So there's some good, but a lot of bad. Right? Never mind, fucking, uh, what's his name? Uh, the Mongol dude. Um, that badass motherfucker who killed everybody. Uh, I can't remember, but that Mongol dude, you know. Fucked everybody, killed everybody. Yeah, he was a big, great, but... But then Sejong the Great. In weakness, with intellect, and with the intellect of his daughter. Created a language to help his people. It's hard to find anyone like him. My understanding is that even in Korea, he's not... He should be on every tongue. Sejong the Great should be on every tongue. And he should be the taste of sweet. 